All right, welcome back to another episode of the FNG. This guy right here, the flying new guy. And uh, what we're going to do is today we're going to be doing a slightly different format. Uh, I'm going to be, it's only two of us. Tom uh, is home with the uh, the bad weather that we've had the last couple of days. And um, what we're going to do is we're going to do an actual ground lesson where, a, a bit more traditional in the sense of the ground lesson where I'm going to be asking Jason questions on a topic. Uh, we're going to pick the um, the aircraft systems chapter, and we're going to do uh, probably about a 30 minute uh, ground lesson today. We'll probably do another session in the future because that's a really big chapter, breaking it down. But I kind of want to get started and asking questions. So uh, yeah, all right. Are you ready to be grilled? Sure. <laughs> all right. Let's get to it. All right. Well. One of the biggest thing I think that students struggle with usually is the engine, is getting like the parts of the engine. Now, uh, I don't want this to be so much road memory stuff. I want I want to ask questions that are a bit more scenario based and um, and things that maybe students usually don't understand all as well. Uh, obviously, if students, if you want more information, we have obviously the course with all uh, all those topics in there. But what, what's the one thing when you're when you're taking a look at your engine gauges? And I know you haven't flown on purpose just yet. What's the one thing that you would really want to be paying attention to in the airplane? In in as term, far as the engine, as far as your engine, yeah, uh, temperature, engine temperature, yeah. Okay. What else? Well, engine temperature or. Well, your cylinder temperature, right? Your cylinder temperature, okay, that's one thing. That's that, one that's, way to look at. Is is that is what it's called, correct? Cylinder. EG, so EGT or CHT. So EGT, exhaust e gas exhaust temperature gas. or cylinder head temperature. Okay. Now, depending on the aircraft, some aircraft have one, some aircraft have the other. Okay. Um, do you know where EGT is measured as opposed to cylinder head temperature? Well, I assume the cylinder head temperature is measured at the cylinder at head. At the cylinder, yeah. Um, and exhaust gas is it's the exhaust that goes through to create your like cabin heat, whatever that the system, yeah. that system is, it's measured in that. It's right after the vicinity. exhaust valve is okay. essentially, right? So you have your compression. What's the four strokes of the engine? Squeeze. So the, the, <laughs> not the four strokes of a, uh, a jet engine. No, the four strokes of the, uh, of a, of a piston engine. I can tell you the principle of operation, but I don't know that I know this, the actual okay. name. So that's something to review. So okay. the we have intake, right? Yeah. What happens so, during the so intake? It, your your four stroke operates the the piston goes down, it pulls in air. Yep. Right. Yep. Air and air and fuel and fuel. Right. And then it compresses. Yep. And goes boom. Yep. And then that is driven down. Yep. As it goes back up, it exhausts. There you go. And it that yeah. is your cycle. Intake compression. So, intake compression. Ignition. Ignition. Exhaust. Exhaust. That's your four stroke. So uh, and I, I like what you said because you said the air gets sucked into the engine. A lot of students don't understand that part. They think the air is getting pushed into the engine, which is not really the case. The as the piston comes down, it's gonna suck the air into the engine, into the chamber. Okay. So at that exhaust point, right after the exhaust valve that opens okay. during the exhaust uh, portion, that's where we measure usually okay. EGT, exhaust gas temperature. Now, there, there are school of thought that say that one is better than the other. Some aircraft are equipped with one and not the other, so it really depends on what you have available. They give you slightly different readings because obviously um, one of them is after the whole compression has happened as opposed to just the cylinder, but they do give you the same kind of indication, too hot, not a good thing, mm. right? And then what What else do you think, uh, and this is, again, something that you may not know not having flown yet, but um, you get four different temperatures. Why is that important? You, you may get four different temperatures, I should say, or four different cylinders, for example. If you have four cylinders, why would that be important? Uh, if you have one that's running really hot, you may lose that cylinder. Yeah. And so then you're going to decrease your performance in your... Yeah. Could yeah. be in an emergency situation or... The very least, it, hey, I want to land right now. Yeah, you want situation. To, you want to make sure you have that. So, so okay. So, exhaust gas temperature, cylinder head temperature. What's what's another temperature or what's another thing in the engine that we want to be paying attention to? Probably your mixture. Your fuel mixture, right? fuel air mixture. Yeah, fuel that's air one mixture. thing. That's one thing. There's something else that's like super, super, super critical. It's it it does five things in your engine. 
It has five different purposes in your engine. It's one thing that we checked today on the car that we went to buy, on the on the van that we went to buy for the company. Oil? Yes, oil. Okay, oil. What does oil do? It does five different things. <laughs> yeah, I know you're getting grilled. It, it, lubricate, also the, it lubricates the engine. It lubricates there's, the engine. There's one. Yeah, that's right. It um, lubricates. It's gonna. It's also. It's a filter, correct? It's a like, filter. It's, it cleans. It's gonna, yeah, it cleans. It cleans. Um, Two. And then I'm, I'm trying to think. The analogy that I thought when you went over that was that the oil is like the blood system. Yeah. And so I drew a parallel there to kind of human anatomy. But I know that it's not going to transport oxygen or anything. No, it doesn't. <laughs> um. Does it cool? Is there a... Yeah, it does. That's... It how, does do, cool. how does it cool? It goes into a reservoir and... I mean, it's... Yeah. Without explaining the thermodynamics of it, essentially you have a little tiny rod of some sort that has oil go through it. Yeah. Your boundary layer heats up. It heats the oil up. That oil is then carried away. So it's constantly yeah. reducing it's the boundary layer of whatever it's traveling through into that it's called the inner cooler is that what it's called mm -hmm. so um okay so lubricate cools cleans one that's a lot less obvious a little less obvious it, on constant speed does it all it also controls yes okay is that the, one of no, the ones that's not part of okay. it okay <laughs> but yes on some constant speed propeller the oil comes from the uh, engine compartment sometimes it doesn't but sometimes it does okay how about seal it creates a seal. So as your uh, piston goes up and down oh. inside the chamber, right, inside the cylinder head, then there's a tiny gap between, mm -hmm. the, between the cylinder and there's a, there is a seal right there, but we also need to use the oil a little bit as sealant. So that's another thing that it does. And then it prevents co corrosion, which is not always an obvious thing either. Yeah. But that's, uh, I mean, that's now something. that you said it, both yeah. of those make total sense. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So it does, it does those five things. What are you looking for as far as indication? So we have two different ways of looking at the, the oil system and how healthy it is. What would what, what you look for? Uh, I assume pressure and temperature. Pressure and temperature, yeah. So oil pressure, extremely critical. I always tell my students, if, um, if you have an, an oil pressure that's too low or too high, then you should start looking for a place to land because that's, it's, not an, it's not an if- it's 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 not a it's not an if it's a when you're going to lose your engine at that stage. So uh, oil is super critical, right? It's it the, your engine is going to heat up if it doesn't have it, and then your engine is going to seize eventually, and then you'll have to find a place to land. So um, always, always when you're flying, look at your oil temperature every once in a while when you take off and you apply full power. You want to make sure that oil pressure is in the green, that oil temperature is in the green. I had many students tell me, yeah, everything's in the green and they're not looking. You know they're not looking. So in the simulator, I used to pull failures of oil and then do that right on takeoff. They apply full power. Everything's in the green. Is it really? It's not. And you want to be careful because obviously losing an engine right on takeoff is the most critical part. Mm -hmm. So you do want to pay attention to that when you do it. So, okay, oil system, that's a good one. How, how's the oil pushed throughout the entire system? No, no. Oil oh. pump? Okay. <laughs> I was going to say a pump of some sort. Yes, but there's a pump. I mean, that, so, that was going to be my guess, but I was like, uh, that's oil pump. Just a guess. It's an engine driven oil pump. It's always going to be on. Okay. And if you lose that, then you're going to lose oil pressure more than likely. So then you want to be paying attention. Okay. Um, all right. Let's go back to the engine portion of the aircraft. What's um, What are some of the specifications of the engine uh, for uh, general aviation engine. What's, what are some of the things? So I'll, I'll give you one. Uh, Air-cooled is one of them, right? As opposed to liquid-cooled. Liquid-cooled. So that's one of, there's usually four things that we have to remember for a general aviation aircraft. So air-cooled, what else? Um, is it the engine, like, the type? Yeah. The horizontally opposed versus... Yep. Um, is it a radial or radial V shaped? Yeah, there's -shaped. there's okay. different. So yeah, horizontally opposed. What does that mean? What does horizontally opposed mean? It means the pistons 
go <laughs> towards the shaft or away well, from away from yeah but this way opus opposite as opposed to at an angle yes. like this in a v shape okay so horizontally opposed air cooled what else how many strokes two stroke four stroke for two yeah typically four strokes and then what kind of um what kind of gears do we have along the way uh to get to the propeller between the engine and the propeller how many gears do we have that's a trick question. Say none. That's right. We okay. Don't have any gears. So <laughs> I don't remember there being a transmission. So <laughs> no, there's no transmission. So direct drive. Direct is, drive. So okay. horizontally opposed, direct drive, air cooled, and four stroke. Four stroke. Typical. That's the typical engine. Um, okay. All right. Well, need to go back and uh, study a little bit more on yep. the engine. Those are. Let's talk about. Let's talk about how we uh, we talked about the spark plugs. Well, we talked about lighting up the fluid inside and the fuel and air mixture, right? So mm -hmm. you're going to use spark plugs. Um, how do spark plugs get their current electricity? From an alternator of some sort. I believe it's the magnetos. The magnetos, okay. Right. So what's a magneto? It's a magnet. It's a magnet. <laughs> and it creates electricity because of rotating pieces how does it rotate how do the pieces inside the uh, magnetos rotate? it's attached to the uh crankshaft it's attached to yep to the so the back of the engine has this uh component called the uh accessory port it's like a usb port in the back of your computer <laughs> where you plug a bunch of things right and um in here you're right it's going to be directly attached to so as the as the crankshaft rotates then so does the magnet inside of the magneto and then it creates electricity and then there's a timing in there mm -hmm. to create a spark every once in a while. So how many magnetos do we have on a typical? Two. Two, okay, why two? Uh, redundancy. Redundancy, okay. What else? Two, so redundancy, there's another reason. Uh, the magnetos are on opposite sides of the cylinder, so it bur it's a better burn better when burn. both fire. At the, the spark same. plugs. The, the when spark both plugs. The, yes, so yeah, so there's two spark plugs per cylinder. Each one is driven by a different magneto. Mm -hmm. And when both magnetos fire at the same time, it gives a better burn because both spark plugs fire yep. at the same time for each how, cylinder. How would you know that you've lost um, one of your magnetos? You're flying, you're cruising around. What would be one of the indication that you lost one of your magnetos? It, you may have some decreased performance mm -hmm. if you're getting uneven burn. Yep. How about, how about how many RPMs do you think would be? I know you haven't flown, so it's more difficult. It's about 100. I was going to say probably 100 or more. Yeah, it's about 100. So you'll know if you're cruising around and all of a sudden you lose a magneto, then the engine's going to sound a little rougher, and then you'll be just losing 100 RPM without touching anything if you're going wings level. Um, how do we control the magnetos? Are they always on? Do we Can we turn them off? It's the keys. The, key. the ignition, right? The ignition switch, yeah. What so, does, what does What's on the ignition switch? It's a switch. Yeah. Right. What? How many positions does he have? Um. Four. <laughs> okay. On. 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 Oh well. Uh, I'm sorry. Off. Off. Right. Left. And both. Right. Left. Both. Uh, for magnetos. Yes. And then there's one more, which is ignition to oh, start. Okay. To start the ignition uh, to start. To start the. Uh, so five. Yeah. So five. Four and a half. And then <laughs> uh, it's a it's a it's spring loaded, so it will come back to. So. What do we do? And I know again, I know you haven't flown. What's what's the reason for having a left and a right mag? Uh, so you can test them. So you can test them. Yep. Or if you, I mean, I guess it wouldn't matter if if you were on both and one went out, you wouldn't want to switch over to that other one. But you, yeah, would if you really needed to, I guess. Yeah, for testing primarily. Now, um, why why do we have an off position on these magnetos? What what does that do? It makes it so you can stop the airplane. It like makes turns, it so you turn can... the engine off because otherwise the magnetos are directly attached to the crankshaft. So as long as the airplane propeller spins, they always create. They're always going to create current. And they're always going to fire. So you could yeah. start the engine, even if if your ignition was on one of those, you could start the engine by checking the prop on a preflight. Yep. So we don't shut down the engine using the magnetos. Okay. We right before we shut down the engine, what we do is we go to the off position for a split second, mm -hmm. see if the engine is going to stop, if the magnetos are going to stop producing electricity to the spark plug. So you'll hear the engine shut down. 
then you go back to both and then you actually go with the mixture down to idle and then you starve the engine of fuel. And the reason you do that is because you want to make sure there's no fuel left in the fuel lines. You want to drain all the fuel mm -hmm. from the fuel lines to get there. But you could technically turn off the engine that way, but the procedure is to actually just starve it. Okay. But you always on the ground, you always check these magnetos go to the off position because that tells you that when you do that, the, the magnetos are actually grounded, which means that if you were to turn the propeller by hand, you're not creating a spark because you've seen from the video, from the course that yeah. that person doing the pre-flight, they turn, they turn, and eventually they get to where that spark plug is doing that. And there may have been fuel left in the fuel lines. I don't know why in this case, but, and then the engine just starts. So it uh, <clears throat> can be extremely dangerous. There's a wire, and I don't expect you to know this, but I think I mentioned it in the course. There's a wire that grounds the magnetos. Do you remember the name of that wire? No. Okay. It's called a P lead. P as the letter P and lead as in lead. So P lead. For those of you that are watching, make sure you remember that. Um, if you want to impress your instructor, if you're fairly new, tell them the, the magneto that grounds. So if, the, if that cable is cut, is de detached, cut, broken, whatever it is, then your magnetos are no longer grounded because the grounding is what sends the electricity to the ground of the aircraft. Right when you go into the off position, you're grounding the magnetos. You're essentially sending all that electricity to nowhere. Mm -hmm. If that cable is broken, then when you go with the magnetos and go in the off position, nothing, nothing is going to happen. happen. The engine is going to continue running. That's why we do that ground check. Okay. On, that's and that's extremely important. Um, what's um, what's the difference between a carbureted aircraft and a, and a fuel injected aircraft? Fuel injected, the fuel is injected directly into the cylinder and that's where it mixes yep. with air. Mm -hmm. Carburetor has a Venturian tube. Yep. Venturian that, tube. Um is your it that is where the air and fuel is mixed prior to being put into the cylinders. Yep. Yep. What's the disadvantage the major disadvantage of a carbureted system? Icing. Icing. You can experience icing in 70 degrees. At least. At least. Yeah. In, depending on humidity. Yeah. Depending on humidity and... Um, Probably a problem you had in Florida, but we won't have here in Arizona. <laughs> no, not a whole lot. Of, well, it depends sometimes in the winter potentially. So, um, okay. This is good. This is good. And what's... Um, so the fuel injected system, uh, a bit more advanced. Do you, you know some of the advantages of the fuel injected system? If I remember correctly, it was more fuel efficient. Yep. More fuel efficient. And um, I want to say it had better performance as well. Typically because of fuel efficiency as well. So yes. One of the big disadvantage is called vapor lock. Do you remember what vapor lock is? Oh, where bubbles get into the, um, this is the problem we had with the laser engraver. Bubbles get into the line into and the then line. It, the air compresses, fluid doesn't compress. Yep. I mean, air is a fluid, but... Well, the liquid happens, fluid. Yeah. So to meter, it's all about metering. In order to meter the fuel, it needs to be metered in liquid form. You cannot meter fuel in vapor form. And when it gets, when the fuel lines get uh, heated, the fuel vaporizes, and then you can't meter the fuel anymore. The only time the fuel gets metered is by the fuel injectors at the very end of the line. To get to the fuel injectors, we need liquid fuel. We don't need vaporized mm. fuel. So it's vaporizing the fuel too early, and then which means that it's much harder to uh, push it to the fuel injectors. So, um, okay, you understand the mixture. What's what's the difference between the red lever, the mixture lever, and the the throttle? <clears throat> what does the red lever do? It controls how much air and fuel, the the ratio. Okay. Right. Yep. I'll take that. Yep. It controls. It's really a pin. It, right, that goes inside the fuel little temporary tank, and then as you give it more mixture, it, it it's like a plug right inside yeah. your your bathtub. Yep. So it controls the amount of fuel, but really indirectly, you're right. It controls the amount of air fuel mixture in there. I like to say that it controls the amount of fuel. What does the the throttle actually do? It, what's what does let let me clarify that. What does the throttle do in a fuel injected system? Just controls the amount of air that goes in there. Okay. Right. So it's it's a simple valve right, that opens and closes. That's it. And and then it controls the amount of, of so, air. So red controls 
fuel. Fuel, black controls air. Yep. But in theory, if you want to think about a, f- a carbureted system, and I know students sometimes ask me that question, but in a carbureted system, because you introduce the fuel with the air before the throttle plate, then technically, yeah, the throttle plate controls the fuel and air mixture Both. that goes into the engine. So, but still, the amount of fuel that goes in there is still controlled still by the controlled mixture. Still controlled by the red lever. So it's it's uh, it's a bit of both. Okay, um, what do we need to look at when we do our our we we, we get to the ramp, we use our fuel sampler, and um, what can we notice in there? What's the the one thing that we need, should be looking for? Or two things. Water and particulate matter. Water and particulate. What would water look like? Uh, it'd be clear. And clear? It, versus whatever color the gas is. We'd be separated? Yes. Okay. We'd yeah. be at the top or at the bottom? Uh, I think it's at the bottom because it's more dense. Yes, it's at the bottom. Okay. Then we talked about magnetos. Okay. All system. We talked about all that. That's pretty good. Engine temperature. Um, let's talk about how do, how does an how does an engine get started? What does it need to get started? Before we have the four stroke cycle, something needs to happen, right? We need to get started with that. A, a starter. A starter. Right. What does the starter do? <laughs> it turns the crankshaft. Turns the crankshaft. It's how? Electrically driven. Electrically driven. Turns the crankshaft until. You can start that cycle. Good until you can start the cycle. And then... It starts moving the pistons around. Yes. Sucking air into the engine. It, it starts, for all intents and purposes, it just starts the cycle using a battery instead of mm-hmm. instead of the cycle self-sustaining. But after it started, it self-sustains. What's the one thing you got to be careful with when you start the engine? Not burning out your... Starter. Starter. Yeah. So Why? You, how, do you, how would you do that? How would you burn it? Uh, you would leave the starter on after the engine started yeah. or you would run it for too long you would run it for too long um there's no circuit breaker typically on starters because they draw a huge amount of current i think it's 60 amp <laughs> that they draw and so and and i may be wrong on that number but it's it's a it's a pretty high number and so what happens is they don't put a circuit breaker on it so if you crank it for too long it just fries it. there's no breaker that's going to pop it's just gonna is, is it such an, an impulse it's it's such a high is there amount. a reason there's not a breaker on it? I think because it's such a high impulse all at once, um, I think it would be hard to control. So at least that's the way I understand it. But uh, they're expensive. They will burn. You have to wait for them to cool off if you crank for too long. So yeah, definitely got to be careful <laughs> with that. Okay, let's get to our let's get to our propeller. Um, how how do we, the engine is starting, right? And then, then we start to move forward. How does the propeller create that forward movement? That's just horizontal lift. It is horizontal lift, exactly. <laughs> so our propeller is kind of like a... It's a twisted airfoil. It's a twisted airfoil. Okay, so let's talk about that twist on the airfoil. Where's the highest angle of attack on that twisted airfoil? At the root or at the tip? At the root. At the root, okay. Why? Why do we have a twisted airfoil? Why don't we have the same angle of attack all the way across? Because running that angle of attack way out here at the end is going to grab a ton of air. So while while that would be good for performance, you would probably break your airfoil. I mean, mm-hmm. it's a moment, right? Yeah. <laughs> so so the it, lift, you, the thrust that's created is really is 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 um, proportionate, proportionate to, to what? Angle of attack and surface area. And? Uh, cord. And? And speed. Speed, yeah. Speed, angle of attack, and then the surface area. So angle of attack and speed. What's the fastest part of the propeller, the tip or the root? The tip. The tip, right? Because yep. it covers more distance in the same... So a larger arc. In the, a larger arc. So because the speed is faster then the angle of attack needs to be less in order to create the same amount of thrust that you would at the root where the speed is less, but the angle of attack is more. Mm-hmm. That's the idea. But you're right. You, you'd, be, you'd, be putting a ton of, um, you'd be putting a ton of 
thrust at the tip of the propeller and bending it forward, mm -hmm. which means that you could break it. It's actually one of the forces that's, uh, that's on here. So, okay. So on a typical GA aircraft, you have what's called a fixed pitch propeller as opposed to what? As opposed constant to- Constant speed. Constant speed propeller. <laughs> yeah. What's a constant speed propeller? It's a propeller with a variable blade angle. Variable blade angle. Okay. How do you change the blade angle? A blue lever. Blue lever. Okay. Or adding what? a lever. <laughs> huh? Adding a lever. Adding a lever. Why, why is that? Why Why do we care to do that? What's the, the uh, purpose of that? More efficiency. More efficiency. Because your fixed pitch is going to give you, it's going to give you better um, performance in a particular situation. Situation, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Like um, what? Like? Like. Climb. Climb. Cruise. Oh, cruise. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. So instead, you're creating a, a multitude of different fixed pitch propeller with a constant speed propeller mm -hmm. that you can choose. So on takeoff, do you want to have a high angle of attack or low angle of attack on the propeller? A high blade angle or low blade angle? Do you want to grab more air or less air? Well, you probably want to grab more air, but... But <laughs> what, I know you're reading my face to see if that's right or not. <laughs> no, what, what I'm thinking is that if you if you're there and you need more, then you're not going to have it. So how fast? What kind of? Let's put it this way. There's two things that you're going to control, right? RPM. Yep. And blade angle. Yep. So on takeoff, do you want a higher RPM or lower RPM? Do you want the engine to rotate as fast as possible, or as low as possible? As low as possible. No. No? As fast as possible. Really? On takeoff, you want to have as many RPMs as you want. Okay. Which means that because you have so many RPM, can you grab a lot of air or do you should you grab less air? Less. Less air. Right? Less air. Less air. So what that does is it allows you to have slightly better um, reaction time. So remember, it's the example that I gave with that, your hand grabbing water. Oh, yes. And and spinning your arm really fast. Mm -hmm. You want to do that when you're in cruise. You you want to start to grab a little bit more air as you do that. But on takeoff, you want to be as high RPM as you can. So the air, so the, the engine is a bit more, um, can react a little bit better okay. to situations. So, um, so always remember high RPM, which means grabbing less air. Okay. And then as you start to get into cruise, you're going to grab more air, a higher blade angle, and then you're going to reduce your RPM, which will give you also better, better efficiency. efficiency. Fuel efficiency. Fuel efficiency yeah. for, for cruising. So that's the big advantage is you, you've got that. So, um, okay, cool. The, I think that's really at the private pilot level, that's really all that I would ask. Um, less stress on the engine. Now, what what makes the blade angle change inside of... The propeller hub oil oil okay yeah i'll take that it has it has its own oil system yeah or or it can be attached to the engine like we talked about you earlier. remember what that component is called that that changes the blade angle no that senses the the changes no the I governor don't. a governor yeah the governor governor <laughs> so <laughs> the governor the, the the governor is a complicated um, part in the engine and the, at the private pilot level I try to keep it as simple as possible but essentially it's a, it's a bit inside of the um, that's directly connected to the crankshaft again it's all relative to the speed of the engine because we talked about the fact that that governor that, that constant speed propeller you can change the blade angle yourself mm -hmm. but there's another bit to it there's another bit to it which is that governor senses changes in speed in your engine and when it does it changes the blade angle automatically in order to keep that speed we call it a constant speed propeller for a reason mm -hmm. because once you set your rpm we want it to stay there we want it to stay at that level and so uh, under normal condition you on a normal flight you take off you set your rpm to 2400 rpm and then you start to pitch up or down without touching anything then the governor is going to take care of that for you. It's going to keep 
the speed, the same constant speed propeller. And uh, by doing that, what it does is it changes the, uh, it, it senses the changes in RPM. And, and when it does, it sends more or less pressure into the hub to send to, mm -hmm. to change the, the the blade angle. It's like a it, it's like an automatic gearbox really for your car. It works. The, the the concept is the same. So that always gets confusing to students. We talked about the blue lever and we talked about the black lever in this case. What does the blue lever control in this case? The blue lever would control your where that governor is trying to it, keep. Okay. It controls physically. It controls the blade angle, but as far as the engine is concerned, what setting on the engine are you changing? Are you changing the amount of air that goes in there? Are you changing the amount of fuel that goes in there? Are you changing the speed of the of the engine? What are what are you changing when you change when you move that blue lever on a gauge? What gauge do you look at, and what does it do? <laughs> and I know you haven't flown again, so I know this is more complex. It's going to be the speed of the engine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so RPM. Your RPM. Yeah. You got it. You got it. Absolutely. So RPM. Blue lever changes RPM. What does the black lever do now? Because it used to change I mean, the it RPM. Would, it would change your RPM. No. Why, why wouldn't it? it? It does, but that's not what it's designed. That's not what it does. So you have another gauge now added. When you have a constant speed propeller aircraft, you're going to mm -hmm. have a new gauge, which is called manifold pressure. MP. Oh, okay. And manifold pressure is measured in, I know this is way more advanced than private, but manifold pressure is measured in inches of mercury. That's what I was going to guess. Yeah. <laughs> inches of mercury because it's pressure. Yeah. Okay. And what it does is it measures the amount of pressure inside of the engine. And uh, it actually, not inside the engine, I take that back, inside the intake manifold. That's what we call it, manifold pressure. Inside the intake manifold, right before the intake valve, there is a there is a sensor right there mm -hmm. that measures how much suction actually goes into the engine. Remember, the engine sucks air, right? Yep. So it actually measures how much suction goes in there. So the interesting bit about this is that it acts as a uh, as a as a pressure uh, as a barometer, because when the engine is shut down, that gauge is going to indicate what the pressure is inside the engine, which is actually really interesting. So as soon as you turn on the engine, then things change a little bit. But um, when you go to idle, you'll see the, the the manifold pressure is going to go down quite a bit. And when you go full power, technically everything is opened up. That gives you the pressure outside. So you'll never have, unless you have a turbocharged engine, if you have a normally aspirated engine, as you apply full power, you're going to get as much pressure as is outside because that's all the pressure that's available. So it's a manifold pressure. It's a, it's a barometer. It's how much suction actually goes into the engine. So it's a really interesting concept. And what you'll do is you'll learn to fly this type of aircraft, um, which is you're going to have two settings. When you learn to fly in a fixed in a, a fixed pitch propeller, you basically learn to set the engine at 2,400 RPM, 2,500 RPM, 1,800 RPM in the pattern, whatever it is. Now you're going to have to learn two different terms. You're going to learn in cruise, you're going to set the aircraft at 22 inches of manifold pressure, 2,200 RPM, or at a different altitude, it might be 21, 23. So you learn these combinations depending on the phase of flight, and you're going to look them up in your POH to find out what those settings should be to get the optimal um, uh, up to performance. performance. Yeah. So yeah, that's uh it's it's always pretty confusing. That's why I want to talk about it. Not nece necessarily something that you need to remember a hundred percent, but um yeah. Okay. Next we get into the electrical system. So I think I might want to stop for now and we can uh, we should do this in two parts. Um if you're watching, hopefully you enjoyed this type of interaction. Actually, I know I enjoy it because I, I get to uh, grill you a little bit yep. and uh, and see what you've studied and what you need to study again. So uh, that's all we have for you today. Like, leave a comment if you want us to talk about more things, and then we'll see you next time for part two. Mm -hmm.